Okay, yeah, I'm uh, Ron Parrott, um, club historian, originally for Hereford United and now for Hereford FC. Um, first got involved with the club at the tender age of three, uh, when my grandfather, Bill Parrott, who was chairman of the supporters club at the time and uh, sports editor of the Hereford Times from the 1920s through till about 1960, uh, decided that it was time for the, the young sprog to be introduced to Hereford United. So I was dragged along to a game. Uh, still have the programme from it, but um, in all honesty, I can't remember the uh, the match itself. But that was it. I was, I was hooked from there on and used to follow the results every week and um, eventually started going under my own steam at a fairly young age and have been watching them ever since. Now, why did, Ron, if you can give us a... a a, you know, a timeline of the club's the club, the beginning to now, where we are now. Are you able to do that? Yeah, okay. Um, the club was formed in 1924, uh, became members of the Birmingham Combination, which was mainly made up of um, companies who had their own football teams, Birmingham Transport, for example, Sunbeam Motors, exotic clubs like that. Um, we stayed in the Birmingham Combination for four or five seasons, uh, then joined the Birmingham League in 1928, which in those days was probably the third highest non-league um, league outside of the Football League. Um, we stayed there until it gradually diminished in stature. Uh, less and less people, less and less clubs were actually uh, becoming involved in the Birmingham League, and it was falling apart, quite honestly. So we sought a higher level of football and we became members of the Southern League, which was the top competition outside of the Football League, in 1939. Uh, great prospects and hopes for the future, but unfortunately we only played four games before the outbreak of war and then football was suspended for the duration of the war. So our, our debut in the Southern League only lasted four matches, all of which were unbeaten, I hasten to add. <laughs> From um, post-war period up to 2014, when, okay. when the club hit its... Yeah, interest and... well post-war, uh, football resumed in 1945-6. Uh, we came very close to winning the title that year, should have won it. Uh, we, we actually finished top, but there were a lot of unplayed games, and the Southern League decided in their wisdom they'd award points for unplayed games, and Chelmsford City, uh, from Essex, um, were given points that they perhaps wouldn't have won and pipped us for the, the league title. And from there on we remained in the Southern League right up until the time of the giant killing with Newcastle in 71-2 and that season culminated in our election to the, the Football League, a lifelong ambition for many Hereford fans. Would you say that match was one of the club's highlights? Oh, without a doubt. Without a doubt. So I wonder, Ron, if you can just say the Newcastle match was... Oh, sorry. That's, that's yeah. OK. Don't be wrong. <laughs> yeah, the 71-2 season and the cup run we had, um, the game against Newcastle will be remembered forever by everybody. Um, it was such a fantastic achievement. Um, I think it was the first time ever that a non-league club had held a, a first division team to an, uh, a draw and then beaten them in a replay. Um other clubs had beaten first division teams before. I think Arsenal suffered against Walsall and uh, Sunderland lost to, uh, to Yeovil, I believe. But it was the first time it had ever gone to a replay. And it was very much that one game that defined the, the future for Hereford. League clubs started sitting up and taking attention at last and thinking, well, perhaps there is a club here that should be given a chance in the Football League. Because in those days there was no automatic promotion and relegation. Um, it was a re-election, so the, the founder members of all the clubs had a representative on the on the board and they voted at the AGM as to whether any new club should be voted in. And there was very much an old pals act, if you like, and you know, they always voted every other club back in again. But this one season, um, we were in contention with Barrow at the bottom, Barrow in Furness, and it actually went to an, yet another replay. That season was full of replays in the Cup. And we tied on votes in the first ballot and then we won in the, the replayed ballot, if you like, and became members of the Football League.
the time when the 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 FA Cup and um, the the win against Newcastle and the going up being elected to the league, what was the feeling amongst fans then? And if you could put my question in your answer wrong, please, thank you. Yeah, um, it had been a long wait for football league status. Um, the club first applied probably back in the late 40s, early 50s. Uh, 1950 in particular, there were quite a few Southern League clubs that did become members of the uh, the Football League. And Hereford decided they wanted to follow suit. So it took from 1950 through till 1972 before we actually made it. So it had been a dream for a lot of people for a, a long time. For you personally, what was it like for you? I'll never forget the occasion um, when we were awaiting the results of the, the Football League's AGM. I was actually on holiday in Norfolk at the time and we were lying on the beach at a place called Brancaster on the North Norfolk coast with a transistor radio all day having no idea what time of day the news was going to come through or if indeed it was ever going to come through. Of course it was in the days before mobile phones so there's no other way of finding out what the news was. But eventually, about five o'clock, um, the news came through on the radio that we'd been elected to the Football League and uh, on the feelings at the time were just indescribable. You know, dancing up and down on the sand. and <laughs> yeah, It was a lifelong ambition again. Um, just going back to the match briefly, um, the, the, it's entered folklore now, hasn't it? That the Newcastle one. Yeah, Newcastle one and the, the, the Ronnie Radford goal. Were you at the match? I was at the game, um, both games. I went to Newcastle um, on the train, um, took time off work. I think we got back into Hereford about half past five the next morning. And that was a wonderful occasion, a full house at St James's Park. Um, they were expecting to slaughter us. Uh, Malcolm McDonald there, England centre forward at the time, had boasted that he was going to score 10. Uh, so we took great delight in, in bringing him down. And we actually took the lead after 13 seconds. We were quite late coming out onto the, the pitch. And all the Newcastle fans were you know, jeering a bit, saying, oh, Harryford is scared to come out, you know. We kicked off 13 seconds later, the ball was in the back of the net. We were all dancing Swan Lake on the back of the stand seats, <laughs> waving to the Newcastle fans. <laughs> and it was a fantastic evening. We thoroughly deserved it. And what people forget is they, they, they look at the replay at Hereford and they say, well, it was a terrible pitch and the mud didn't suit the opposition and it never would have happened. But what they forget is we, we beat them over two games. First game at Newcastle, perfect evening, perfect playing surface, and we outplayed them. You know, we could have easily won that one. Did the City then recognise what their football team had done? At the time, you have to remember that the, the county of Herefordshire was undergoing a lot of change. It was at the time of the merger with Worcestershire. So the exploits of Hereford United actually came to represent the county in the outside world. And everybody took so much more interest in Hereford United than perhaps, in fairness, they normally would have done. They were fighting the cause of the county, if you like. Um, so the following we had in those days was just unbelievable. And every car, every car had stickers on them saying, say no to the merger, you know. And next to that was the Heritage United badge or poster, you know. It was just a tremendous time. The, the, the atmosphere, the, the fervour, if you like, around the town. Everybody was interested. Yeah, we probably could have filled the Edgar Street twice over that day. In fact, there's a very famous story going, do, doing the rounds that I know is true. I've, heard it from a reliable source as they say um, there was a board meeting the week before the Newcastle game and the secretary came bursting into the boardroom and said to the chairman Frank Miles he said Frank he said we've got a problem uh, we've gotten the, we, we've sold all the tickets and Frank just looked round at him and said that's not a problem just go and print some more and that's a true story so although it wasn't officially our record crowd um, nobody will ever know how many were in Edgar Street Personally, I'm convinced that it would have beaten our all-time attendance record against Sheffield Wednesday in 1958. And what was that? 18,114 was the record attendance. 
uh, again in the FA Cup, again in the third round, first time we'd ever got to the third round uh, against First Division Sheffield Wednesday. Um, we didn't win that one, but we held our own for about an hour, and then they scored. They scored one fairly early on, and then sealed it with two more late goals. Um, can you describe? Um, I've, I've been looking at old photographs and footage of, you know, matches at Edgar Street, and that it seems to be um, a family uh, event. You know, there'd be women there, children, dads, granddads. Can you describe a typical? weekly attendance at a Hereford match? Yeah, the Hereford games back in the 70s in particular, although there was a lot of football hooliganism about at the time, Hereford stood apart. It was very much a family club. And even through all the, the troubled times, families still attended. Um, all generations used to turn up together. It was just a wonderful occasion. I was talking to... Um... Patricia Morrow. Oh, Pat, yeah. Yeah, Pat. And, um, she, you know, mad football fan, Hereford fan. Would you say that um, there were lots of uh, women who came along to matches? In the and 70s in particular, there were probably as many women as there were men. Not quite, but far more than there are today. Um, young girls used to come along because they, they quite fancied some of the younger players and... Uh, mothers used to come along to watch their uh, offspring play because uh, there were all different levels of football, different age groups and different leagues for the different standards. So it, it has very much always been a family club, even today. You know, we've got teams playing at about six different levels now, all under the same banner name of, of Hereford FC. And so um, what, are there any other highlights of the club's history that stand out for you? Because we know we all know about the Newcastle and the Killer Goal. Any others? Over the years, there have been so many highlights. It's difficult to recall them all. Many giant killing acts in the in the FA Cup. Um, sometimes it's not necessarily a, a massive cup win or a, a league victory that takes the highlight. Um, my memories. Uh, one of my favourite ones was quite recently in the season. Uh, before the um, the undesirable people took over the club, uh, we went to Aldershot for the last game of the season. And not only did we have to win, but we had to rely on Salisbury, who incidentally we, we played in the, the FA Vars this week. Uh, they had to get at least a point at Chester to stop Chester finishing above us and get this relegated. And the game was so full of emotion, it was unbelievable. And right at the very end, in the space of about 30 seconds, everything changed. One minute we were drawing and Chester were winning and therefore we were relegated. And then we scored to beat Aldershot 2-1. And within 30 seconds, Salisbury scored at Chester, so they were drawing. And um, we, we actually stayed up, although months later, unfortunately, we, we got relegated anyway. But for sheer emotion, that game takes some beating. And very often disappointing performances as well stand out in your mind. Um, I'm so pleased this week that we've actually got to Wembley. It's been a lifelong ambition of mine. And four times I've been within 90 minutes of seeing Hereford at Wembley. And each time we failed at the last hurdle. And on Saturday we, we were 1-0 up from the first leg and they equalised. And I thought, oh no, here we go again. But we came through that one. But I'll, I'll never forget the very first one at um, Leicester City's original ground at Filbert Street back in 1970. We got to the semi-final of the FA Trophy and we were playing a team called Hillingdon Borough from London. And we played them twice in the Southern League that season. We'd put six goals past them at home, four away. And it was a foregone conclusion. We were going to play at Wembley. We were going to beat them easily. And we lost 2-0, complete with John Charles and everything. Just didn't turn up on the day, didn't perform. And for the wrong reasons, that game will stick in my mind forever. So it made Saturday's victory against Salisbury even sweeter. It's been an exciting couple of weeks, Ron, FA Vars. Do you want to tell us about it? The FA Vars is the competition for um, clubs below the Southern League um, or Northern League um, area. Um, so we are in the top tier of teams that are actually 
able to compete in that. Years ago, it used to be known as the Amateur Cup. And post-war, back in the late 40s, early 50s, 100,000 people would fill Wembley to see the Amateur Cup final. Um, those days have gone. Football has changed. But nevertheless, it's, it's still a national final at Wembley. Um, my personal lifelong ambition to see Hereford play at Wembley. So through the different rounds as we progressed, it's been quite traumatic. We've had some difficult ties, but come through them all, uh, culminating in the semi-final uh, two-legged match against Salisbury. Uh, we beat them 1-0 at home in the first leg and travelled to Salisbury last weekend. Um, again, with everybody's dream of, of playing at Wembley. So it was a game you had to go to. I was fortunate enough to get tickets. Um, there were many people who didn't. We probably could have sold our allocation four times over. But as a day out, it was a wonderful occasion. Absolutely wonderful. The atmosphere was terrific. The players gave it everything. And we thoroughly deserved the, the victory overall. Um, so the next stop now is Wembley. My tickets are already booked. Hotel is booked. I can't wait. And I think, being totally honest now, um, I wouldn't mind how we performed. It was my ambition to see Hereford at Wembley, and that's going to happen. I'm going to be happy. I, yeah, as I said earlier, I've supported Hereford since I was knee high, really. And as I grew up, I started playing football myself. And at school, everybody supported Manchester United and Arsenal. And, and they used to ask me who I supported. And the answer was always the same. Hereford. Hereford United. There's only one United. And I think that's what made it more important as we progressed up the footballing ladder. Uh, the highest we've ever achieved was the old second division, which is now, of course, the, the championship. You know, and you, it, To me, it was a dream come true. On equal terms, we were playing teams like Chelsea, Wolverhampton Wanderers, Southampton... Yeah, teams uh, as a child I never dreamt I'd see Hereford play against and we were playing them on equal terms another dream come true at this moment in time the situation we're in is, is exceptional um, as you know the club the new club was only formed 15 months ago 15 months ago we had a club name we had a ground having successfully negotiated a new lease on the ground we had no team and no manager and 12 months later, here we are in Wembley. And so as a community, the spirit within the football club, within the supporters, is better than I've ever seen it. There's no mistrust, as there always is, between the board and fans and supporters. Everybody knows who's in charge. They know they're decent men. They're men that have got no interest in making money out of the redevelopment of the ground. Everybody pays their way. Even the chairman has to pay for his own season ticket. So the community spirit is, is really, at this stage, greater than it's ever been in the history of the club. I wonder if we can go back to the dark days of 2014. Well, the, the darkest days of the club, um, there have been a few over the years. Relegation from the Football League in '96 was probably the worst of those. Um, but that was uh, overridden entirely by the events of 2014. Um, the club had been mismanaged for several years. Um, we had a new chairman whose heart was in the right place, uh, but it turned out that he didn't manage the club's affairs very well, and we, we lost a lot of money in a very short time. And he decided that he wasn't prepared to put any of his own money in and wanted to put the club up for sale. Unfortunately, the people that he sold it to... Um, weren't local people, uh, they were Londoners, some from Essex, and the, the chairman, as it turned out, was a, a convicted criminal. Uh, he bought the club for a pound, um, and it was soon decided by the FA that he wasn't a fit and proper person to be chairman of the club, so he had to find somebody else to manage it. And we had a su succession of people that were in charge, um, culminating in, in a situation where the fans boycotted the club. They didn't like the way it was being run in. Uh, they didn't like the prospects of that. these people redeveloping the ground and reaping the profits from it. So in a, attendances of 2,000 plus soon dropped to about 300. Um, myself, personally, I boycotted it completely, which, which hurt. Um, on a Saturday afternoon, I just didn't know what to do. 
Uh, I used to go to the ground, buy my programme to keep the records going, and, and that was it. I, I had no interest in the club. Um, I actually rejoiced when they lost. I remember my wife saying at the time, she couldn't believe it. She said, I never thought I'd see the day when you'd come home and say, oh, good, Harryford have lost. <laughs> it was just it was just unreal. and It, it wasn't our club. It, it was no longer our club. And um, things went on. Uh, they got themselves into a lot of debt. Uh, money was required to pay the tax man. We, had, we faced about 20 different winding up orders. Uh, we went to court nine or ten times. And each time the, the chairman of, of the day was saying, yes, yes, we have investors, we're going to save the club. And the judge finally came to the end of his tether and said, look, you've got one more week. If you don't come up with this proof that you've got the money, the club will be put into liquidation. And lo and behold, a week later, the next court case came up. Um, the barristers were there. Um, the chairman of the club wasn't. And the judge basically said, well, have you got proof that the, the money is now available? And the barrister said, yes, it is. I can confirm that it is available. The chairman has got it with him. He's in his car on the way here and he's stuck in traffic. And the judge basically said, I've had enough of this. And he said, that's it. The club is, is going into liquidation. It's been wound up today. And I'll never forget the day. It was a very sad occasion. But also, as things have turned out, the best thing that could have happened to the club I was having afternoon tea in the Castle Pool Hotel and the news reached me that this had happened and an appeal went out for fans to get down to the club immediately because some of these people that were there um, were basically stripping the assets of the club. Uh, one of the trainers, when we got there, reversed his car up to the door and TVs were coming off the wall and being loaded into the back and so we did our little bit to, you know, to make sure they didn't get away with it. And um, that really was the end of the club. We never saw these people again. They disappeared. Uh, I think they had put some money in, in fairness, but only to keep the, the club going. At one stage, the council tried to repossess the ground under the cover of darkness because they'd um, not paid the, the rates on the ground for God knows how long. Unfortunately, it failed because people were actually living in the club a lot of the young players were on bunk beds in the boardroom and yeah, it really was a mess. Um, and then the very next morning, uh, these people came up with about £30,000 to pay the backlog of, of rates. So they had money, but they had no intention of keeping the club going. You know, all they wanted was the, the development rights for developing either end of the, of the ground. But that's all behind us now. As I say, the new people in charge that now own the club have no interest in this. They're quite happy for the council to develop it if they want to and take the profit themselves. So it's a new club. Everything has changed and everybody is happy. I think that's the important thing, including myself. I'm happier now with the direction the club's taken and the way it's being run than I ever have been. Yeah, the, the old club... Um, had been around for 90 years and um, until 2014 when things went rapidly downhill. Um, fans, when the, the, the thing went under, fans were devastated. There's absolutely no two ways about that. But having said that, there was almost a feeling of relief that the thing had come to an end because everybody knew it was going to end in disaster. And although the club folded, we all knew that it was for the best. And there was hope for the future. You know, people were saying, well, if a new club's formed, it's not going to be Hereford United, it's going to be a new club. But my official view as club historian at the time was I, I didn't agree with that at all. As far as I was concerned, it was going to be Chapter 2. You know, we're still playing in Edgar Street, we, we're still in black and white, we've still got the famous bull's head on the on the shirt. As far as I'm concerned, it's still Hereford United. Unfortunately, the, the FA have deemed that if a club goes under, they can't come back under the same name straight away. So we're going to be Hereford FC for five years, but in four years' time now, we'll be Hereford United again. Do they still sing the club anthem at matches? Oh, the club anthem has been around since 71-2, um, when Danny Lee first sang it. Um, and it's as popular now as it ever has been. It's still sung every week, and it's still Hereford United, not Hereford FC. Um, but yeah, it's, it's tradition. Sorry, can we have that bit again? I, I just tweaked the camera a bit at the wrong moment.
without the anthem, without the, the song. Is that all right? Yeah. Sorry. Did you also say what it is, Mum? Is it Her Who Will Neither Do We Love You? That's all right. Yeah. yeah. Did you say that? In yeah. yeah. Sorry. Okay. Yeah, the club anthem um, was sung originally by Danny Lee back in 1970, 71. Um, it's known as Hereford United, We All Love You. Um, it's as popular now as, as it was then. It's sung at every home game. Um, and it is still Hereford United. They don't sing Hereford FC, We All Love You. It's Hereford United. Always will be. And what about team colours? Team colours are identical. Uh, we're still playing white shirts, black shorts, uh, with the ball's head on the, the left of the, the chest. So that's another reason, really, for saying that it is one and the same thing. It's still Hereford United. Why is it important to have football teams playing as a team? From the community point of view, um, Hereford United is very, very important, I think, to the town. It brings lots of visitors in. Um, gone are the days when it brings undesirables in. They are genuine people attending matches nowadays. So I'm sure the centre and the, the city and the county have, have benefited from it in terms of shopping, in terms of accommodation, people coming for the weekend, staying over them for the weekend, touring round. Yeah. Now, in the, um, over the years, Hereford uh, United has played against some names even I wouldn't know. Well, over the years, we've played, I think, all but about four of the premiership sides nowadays in one form of the comp uh, one competition or other. Um, we've never played Liverpool. We've played Arsenal on uh, four occasions, um, once in the FA Cup, went to a replay. We were un unlucky not to beat them at Hereford. We played them in the League Cup and came within about I think 12 or 13 minutes of becoming the first ever fourth division side to win at Highbury. Uh, we played Manchester United in the Cup. Um, in fact, many say that Alex Ferguson owes his whole career to Hereford. Um, they came down to us uh, at a time when he hadn't been with the club very long. They were four or five from the bottom, not playing very well. And they came to little Hereford in the third round of the Cup. And if they'd have lost, he would have been sacked. I don't think there's any doubt about that. Uh, we should have beaten them. Uh, we lost to a goal by Clayton Blackmore with about eight minutes to go. And we were all dreaming of a replay of going to Old Trafford. And that one goal resurrected his career. And, of course, the rest is the rest is history. So if it wasn't for Hereford United, Alex Ferguson wouldn't have had the, the career that he had. I understand that um, Graham Turner is second to Alex Ferguson in managers? In terms of long-serving managers, yeah. yeah. Graham Turner was with Hereford for a, a long while. Uh, came in originally in, cool, when would that have been, 94? Um, and the only person who I think served in football management longer than him was actually Alex Ferguson. Um, but Graham... Did a lot for the club, started off as, as first team coach, uh, eventually bought the club when things went wrong, uh, often regretted that he did. <laughs> um, but he, in fairness, he did a very, very good job financially. Um, he slowly, slowly turned the club round, season by season, bought a better class of footballer in and slowly started to bring Hereford back up the leagues again until eventually we got back into the, the football league. Um, in a playoff against Halifax Town at Leicester City's ground. Um, Graham eventually decided he wanted to go back into managership with Shrewsbury Town, who he was with for a long time before. Uh, so he left us and went back there. He was actually given freedom of the city, uh, still lives in, in Herefordshire, and very often comes to watch the games at home now. Yeah, Graham Turner... Um, became our manager back in about 94. Um, in his first season, he took us up to the playoffs in the old fourth division. Unfortunately, we failed in the final of that. Um, and again, we came within 90 minutes of Wembley. And then the next season, sadly, uh, we suffered 
relegation uh, with the final shootout on the last day of the season with Brighton and Hove Albion. Uh, the winners of that, well, we we had to win. Brighton had to draw to stay up. And unfortunately, have, having taken the lead, we drew one all. Uh, so we went down to the conference, which was devastating at the time. After all those many, many years of hard work getting into the Football League, to see it all thrown away like that was, was terrible. There were a lot of tears in the, the main stand that day. Um, but Graham Turner offered his resignation. The board turned it down. He stuck with the club, uh, slowly started to rebuild it. Uh, when the original board decided the time had come to move on, they offered Graham the opportunity to, to buy the club, uh, which he did. So he became chairman, manager, chief coach, <laughs> chief bottle washer, just about everything. Um, and slowly but surely, he built the club back up. Standard of football improved each season. Um, financially, he got things together. He wasn't a financial man. He was a footballing man. But nevertheless, he did a fantastic job. Eventually got the club into the black. Um, when he finally called it a day and moved on to Shrewsbury, he left the club with quite a healthy bank balance of about half a million, um, which within three or four years have been turned into a debt of about a million and a half. And the, the, the Edgar Street ground, ground, we have the Addison ring or street, named after Colin. What's Colin's, um, what's his role? What's, what's he, he, he seems to have more, you know, hero status. Colin. Yeah, Co Colin Addison is a folk hero, a legend in, in Hereford, and he'll tell you himself he is. <laughs> he, he loves to chat. Um, but yeah, Colin took over from John Charles as manager of Hereford in 1971. Uh, in fairness, inherited most of his side, but tweaked it, and he had an uncanny ability to get the best out of players. Uh, perhaps fairly average players, but under Colin they were heroes. And we had a great cup run, of course. And Colin has always lived in Hereford, uh, still lives in the same house now that he did when he moved to Hereford in 1970. Um, he's had a second spell as manager, which wasn't quite as successful as the first one. Uh, he then moved on and eventually joined the board and was there during that final fateful season. Um, although I hasten to add, it was absolutely nothing to do with him. Um, Colin... Is still recognised as a cult hero around Hereford and uh, has had the main bar at the club named after him. Uh, even has a road named after him just down the road from Mega Street on, on the corner, Addison Court, I think it is. Um, he still comes to games now with his great friend Pete Isaac, who has also been a fantastic servant to the, the club over the years. Um, and he's still very, very welcome. Peter Isaac is a hero, one of my favourite people, a real gentleman, um, a good amateur boxer in his time in the, the Welsh Valleys, uh, eventually played footballing, he was a goalkeeper, a very good goalkeeper too, started off with Barry Town and then eventually moved to Northampton Town in the, in the old fourth division, uh, came to Hereford in the very early 60s and basically has been there ever since. He served the club in every capacity you can manage. He was a player, he was a coach, he was a tea maker, he was a laundry man, the kit man. Wonderful chap, wonderful chap. Will do anything for you, a real gentleman. And he still comes now, um, not quite so often perhaps as he used to, but he still supports the club and likes likes to come and see them. Is there, what is it about the club that instills this, this loyalty through thick and thin, you know? What is it? Hereford is a, a family club, very much so. And if a player comes to Hereford, it, and it is amazing how many players have come to Hereford from, from elsewhere in the country and have settled here. You know, going back to the 50s and 60s, there's still loads of players around Hereford. And it, it does have that magical attraction. It, you know, it, it's not the perhaps the most attractive place in the world to live. You know, the youngsters will tell you that anyway. But it is a beautiful city. Yeah, the people are very friendly. Um, they make you welcome. Uh, from the football club in particular, you know, it's like being a member of a, a close family. And even when you leave, you still get invitations to come back to open days. And 
you know, players are all, ex-players are always welcome. And as I say, there are so many that have settled in, in Hereford over the years. I wonder if we can talk about one, um, Tommy Best. Tommy Best, yeah. yeah, wonderful chap, Tommy Best. Tommy was a, a centre forward. Um, I can't remember where he's from originally, but he was the first black player ever to turn out for Hereford. Um, stayed with us for about five or six seasons. Uh, he played for QPR, um, an excellent striker, had a great record, big bustling old-fashioned type of centre-forward. Um, he's still alive now. Uh, he's in a nursing home down in Ledbury Road. Um, I went to see him oh, a couple of years ago now. We had an old goalkeeper of ours who uh, lived down in Romford in Essex and came back uh, for a day and we made him welcome, gave him a good weekend bought him a photograph of one of his appearances for Hereford in 1950. And at the end of the day, he thanked me so much for looking after him. And he said, one last question, Ron, he said, do you think there's anybody else in Hereford that's still here from my era? And we're talking late 40s, early 50s. And I thought hard and I thought, oh. there was Roy Williams, who unfortunately was, was seriously ill with cancer at the time. And then I thought, Tommy Best. So I rang the nursing home up that night. I said, look, I can't make any promises, but I'll, I'll give them a ring and you know, see if we can get in to see him. So I rang the nursing home up and asked them if they'd go and have a word with him and see if he'd be willing to meet Jock Leffen. And they phoned me back and said, yes, he'd love to. So we made the arrangements and picked him up from his B&B and took him down to see Tommy Best the next morning. And they met each other. Their eyes met down the corridor and they almost ran you know, with their Zimmer frames and crutches, but they almost ran to each other and embraced each other, and it, it was just wonderful to see. And <laughs> there are two things that stick in my memory. I, mean, I was chatting away to Tommy, and I, I was asking him what it was like in those days for black players to be playing in, in English football, and he said it was terrible. He said, far, far worse, obviously, than it is today. Yeah, he used to, he used to get the monkey chance and people throwing bananas at them, and he, he said it was dreadful. And it, I'll never forget, he said, the worst place of all was Merthyr Tidville. He said they were terrible down there. And he had a twinkle in his eye when he looked at me and he said, you know what, he said, the more they ridiculed me, he said, the harder I tried. And I thought, what a wonderful attitude. And then as we were going out, um, this guy was, had to head back home to, to Essex. And as he was leaving, Tommy Best took me on one side and he patted me on the shoulder. He said, that jockey said he was a dirty bugger. <laughs> <laughs> and he was the goalkeeper. <laughs> so that, that was Tommy Best. Thankfully, he's still alive now. Um, somebody was telling me that the, the um, football commentator, the all-known uh, John Motson, cut his teeth during the Newcastle Hereford game. Is that correct? Similar to Alex Ferguson, um, Motson also owes his career to Hereford United. He was a junior reporter at the time we played Newcastle in the Cup um, and he was allocated the replay at Edgar Street and two of Hereford's players actually lived in Barnet and we'd signed them from Barnet and that was where Motson came from. Uh, so they actually travelled up to Hereford in the, the, the same car for the match. Um, the idea was that Newcastle were going to win, the script said they were going to win and he might just get an odd five-minute highlight at the end of match of the day. Uh, of course, the rest is history. Uh, he commented on the commentated on the game. We won it, and it became the the main match of the BBC for match of the day that night. And of course, the goal went on uh, to win the goal of the month competition, and finally the goal of the season competition. So John Motson was immediately catapulted from an unknown status to one of their their head commentators in a very short time and we have reunions of the old giant kid in 11 every yeah, five years probably and every single one john motson comes to even now he, he's got a very soft spot for hereford i didn't know that hmm David Icke, yeah, strange character. Um, David joined Hereford as, a, as an amateur from Coventry City back in 1970. As a goalkeeper, he was quite a slender lad, not very well built, um, but a good keeper. He made some tremendous saves, good shot stopper. 
Um, unfortunately, he had problems with arthritis, and he was advised when he was at Coventry City that he really should stop playing, uh, but he decided he'd persevere with it, and he was in goal for the, Her the first of Hereford seasons in the Football League when we got promotion in our first year. And I think statistically, he probably goes down in, in Hereford's history as having the best defensive record, least number of goals conceded per appearance. Probably because he had a, such a tremendous defence in front of him. But even so, he proved himself. Uh, he had one more season with the club. And then eventually the arthritis in his knee got worse and he was forced to pack the game in completely. And as we all know, he pursued a somewhat different career after that. <laughs> um, just talking about some of the characters that behind you know, the apparatus of the club, I've got um, uh, Grenville Smith. Yeah, Grenville Smith was a director of the club for several years. Um, Ex-policeman. Uh, made his name, I think, really for fundraising. No, he, I mean, Grenville was a director of the club yeah. um, for three or four or five yeah. seasons, perhaps, uh, before the demise of the club. Um, well known for his fundraising activities. He ran the Starlight Room and arranged yeah. for um, different acts to appear there. Uh, did, did a good job, yeah. um, but he has nothing to do with the club now right. whatsoever. I knew Derek Evans quite well, as a youngster, admittedly. Um, he was a member of the Herefordshire Ph Photographic Society, of which my father was a, a member as well. And I remember every Sunday we used to go on family outings, on these Photographic Society outings, visiting remote spots of Herefordshire and taking photographs of Arthur Stone at Dawson and yeah, things like that. So, yeah, it was, it was a, again, a good family occasion. I remember Derek at Edgar Street very well, yeah, for many, many years. What, can you... Just give, give us an idea of him in action, maybe. Yeah. Just rushing up and down, clipping. I mean, what, um, yeah, that sort of thing, just to give us a... Yeah, Derek, Derek at Edgar Street was quite an active man. Um, he would give anything to get a decent shot of the action. Uh, sometimes getting very close to encroaching on the pitch and seeing him crouching behind the, the, the post or <laughs> taking pictures through the net. And he was quite an artistic photographer, I think, and some of his pictures of the, the action you know, would stand up pretty well, I think, with today's modern standards of, of photography. And um, you, you, he was there during some of, or many of the club's high points, high low points. Derek was there from the 50s right through until we got into the Football League and for a few seasons after that as well. So he was the guy who took some of the famous photographs of the, um, the Newcastle game, uh, the PC in the dressing room uh, undoing Billy Meadows' boots and taking them off. And you know, He always came up with original shots, if you like. He used a lot of imagination in them. He was. Derek had supported the club for many, many years. So not only as a photographer, but as a supporter as well. Yeah, Derek's photographs have stood the test of time. Um, it would be nice when they're all archived together so people can actually access them. Uh, personally, I've got quite a few in my own collection that I'd put in with the, the programmes. Um, and there's some wonderful shots there. I think they're very important as part of the archive. And the only criticism I have of Derek is he never wrote on the back what they were. So I, it, he's caused me a lot of trouble. Uh, I've got these wonderful photographs that I've inherited of his, but I've got no idea who the players are. <laughs> Normally I can track them down, a bit of investigation in the Hereford Times or whatever. I, I can find similar pictures and think, oh, yeah, that's so-and-so. But, yeah, but wonderful to have. And I'm hoping in the future that access to his other pictures will be more available to the, the general public. I'm going to change the subject slightly, Ron, because we're, uh, we're, going to, we're coming to an end now. But um, nothing to do with football, or Derek, really, well, sort of. But um, mm. did you ever go to the Mayfair in Hereford? I've been going to the Mayfair like every child in Herefordshire <laughs> since the age of about four or five. 
your memories of it? Where, what did you do? What did you go on? I, th I think memories of it. It's disappointment now. The whole Mayfair has changed so much over the years. It's about a quarter of the size that it used to be. And when I started first going as a youngster, it went right the way down to the bottom of C Commercial Street. It used to go right down by the railway station. There was a big wheel and everything was down there. Uh, there used to be a big car park by Raven Hills opposite the entrance to the railway station. There was a massive car park there. That was always full. Uh, they had a boxing rink and you know, people would just turn up and take on the all challenges and yeah, you know, the whole thing has shrunk. And the, I suppose the rides are probably more exciting now than they used to be. Um, but obviously, as a youngster, the ghost train was probably the most popular thing. Um, but yeah, it, I mean, it's changed over the years. But it's still a wonderful event. You know, children, I, I, I've taken my children, I've taken my grandchildren, and hopefully that tradition will continue forever. And what about hot picking? Did you ever go hot picking? I've never been hot picking in my life, I'm afraid, no. No, my mother used to many, many years ago. Um, out in Dormington, they used to have a big, big hot field. Well, still do, in fact, out in Dormington. Um, but again, that's changed. The travelling community don't turn up any longer for hot picking. It's all mechanised. And yeah, to a great extent, that's a shame. But it's modern progress; you can't halt it. And I think the days of the travelling hot pickers are, are, have long gone. But I know Derek had some wonderful photographs of it. He's recorded that for history because that would have been lost forever. Not the sort of event people would normally photograph. But again, that was Derek. You know, he'd pick on something ordinary and turn it into something extraordinary. Peter Davis, yeah, he he used to be heavily involved with the Vice Presidents Club, um, which was a club started uh, by John Jackson, who was landlord of the Salmon Inn. Um, he was the director of the club, and his project was to get the Vice Presidents Club up and running. Um, basically, it was a club designed for local businessmen uh, to come in, watch the club in comfort in their own lounge, the bar and everything else. Um, very, very popular in the early days. Uh, you had to be um, nominated and seconded to, to get in, and there was always a long waiting list. Um, so he had a lot to do with that. He controlled it for a few years, um, was heavily involved with the club in developing the ground and so on. And no doubt he's got fond memories of his time there.